All right. Um, so this is going to be 6.2. Um, so now we're going to work with uh, complex numbers and trig together. All right. So this is trigonometric oops, form of complex numbers. All right, so the first thing we want to introduce um, in this section is uh, visualization. So for a regular real number, right, how do we visualize it? So how do we visualize the number three, right? We draw a line, we draw zero here, one, two, three. That's three, right? How do we visualize minus uh, two? One, two in this direction, right? That's minus two, all right? Um, two thirds. That would be this guy right there, right? So uh, I guess I should, right? That's three, that's minus two, here's two thirds, all right? So for real numbers, you can visualize them on the real line, right? You draw a line and then you, you plot the point uh, where that number is. So for complex numbers, we know complex numbers can always be written as a plus bi. So if, let me do this with an example. Uh, 3 plus 2i, right? How do we visualize that? Well, we can't do it on the real line because i does not live on the real line, right? i is not a real number. So in order to visualize this, what we do is we draw an axis like this, a planar axis, um, kind of like an xy axis. And uh, I am actually going to label them x and y. And what we do is we plot the... Um, uh, essentially, we plot the point 3, 2, all right? So the, the 3 right here, we go 3 steps to the right. The 2 right there means we go 2 steps up, okay? Uh, so we end up right there. Oops. We end up right there. That represents 3 plus 2i, okay? So this is how we visualize uh, complex numbers, and it's actually super, super useful um, uh, in real life. So if you're... Um, so maybe you, you, you've been wondering, you know, when do we care about complex numbers? Uh, physics cares very much about complex numbers. In fact, um, you know, real life physics depends on complex numbers. Quantum mechanics in physics depends on, on uh, complex numbers. And uh, so complex numbers, you know, it seems like it's weird to us. We even call them imaginary numbers sometimes. But there actually are real things. They are true things in that um, to understand physics, you need to understand complex numbers, all right? Okay, um, so this is how you would plot complex numbers. You have to plot them on an axis, and we usually call this the complex plane, all right? And that's in contrast to the real line up here, okay? So complex numbers um, have to be drawn in a plane. So let me draw just a couple more. So for example, minus two plus five i would mean um, two steps to the left. So the, the horizontal axis represents the um, uh, this part of the um, complex number and the vertical axis represents this part of the complex number, all right? So minus two uh, means two steps to the left and then plus five i means uh, five steps up. One, two, three, four, five. So this would be minus 2 plus 5i, okay? Down here, uh, this point right here would be something like, um, well, it would be exactly minus 2 plus, oh, sorry, minus 2 minus i, all right? And then, uh, for example, this point right there, that would be 2 minus i, all right? By the way, um, i would be that guy right there, right? Because i is 0 plus i. So um, let me write it over here. i equals 0 plus i. So that would mean you plot the point 0, comma 1, all right? Minus i would be 0 minus i. So you plot the point 0, comma, negative 1. So minus i would be actually be that guy. Let me label them. So this one is i. This one is minus i right there. And uh, what about just the regular real numbers? Uh, 4 is 4 plus 0i. So that means you plot the point 4 comma 0. All right? So that would be right there. Okay? So the, the real numbers actually just live on the x-axis. 
All right. Okay. Um, so that's our introduction to visualization. Uh, it's it's going to be very useful for us in our class. Uh, and the first kind of really nice thing um, that we can see is if we look at 3 plus 4i, let's call that z, then its complex conjugate is 3 minus 4i. Where do I plot this? 3 plus 4i is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, right there. Its complex conjugate is 1, 2, 3 to the right also, but four steps down. All right? And of course, um, if you think about this, right, because to get the complex conjugate, you, you always flip the sign from plus to minus or minus to plus. What's happening is, in terms of the picture, is if you start with a, with a complex number and you want its conjugate, you reflect that across the x-axis to the other side. That's the complex conjugate, all right? So for example, the complex conjugate of this number right there, this complex number, would be the corresponding guy in terms of the picture right up there, all right? On the other side of the x-axis, okay? Um, this makes sense in terms of real numbers, right? If I had just had a real number, three, right? Um, that's equal to three plus zero i. So what is its complex conjugate? Its conjugate uh, is three minus zero i, right? Which is still three, right? So um, three lives right there. Its complex conjugate is the same place. And that makes sense, right? Because if you reflect across the x-axis, that number, anything on the x-axis will stay in the same place, all right? So complex uh, conjugates or conjugates have a very nice uh, kind of visual representation compared to the um, uh, original complex number, all right? Flipped across the x-axis. All right. Um, next, more kind of um, visualization ideas. So. Let's look at um, uh, 3 plus 4i again, right? So it lives 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, right there, all right? Now let's think about um, something from just real numbers. So let me draw a real line down here. What is the absolute value of 3, all right? The absolute value of 3, well, 3 lives here. The absolute value of 3 is 3, okay? Now, I think... One way to think of it, or one way to think of it is absolute value of three is the distance from three to zero, all right? Now, this distance idea, it might seem kind of silly, right? But it actually makes sense if you think about what's the absolute value of negative three. Negative three lives here, right? What's the absolute value of negative three? It's also three, but that's also the distance from here to here. Right? So absolute value of anything minus 5 is equal to distance to oops um, distance to 0, right? Absolute values of negative of, uh, of real numbers is just its distance to 0, right? Distance uh, I guess this is too vague. Distance of minus, uh, from minus 5 to 0. right? Absolute value of minus 3 is distance from minus 3 to 0. Uh, absolute value of 10 is distance from 10 to 0, all right? Why do I want to think about it like this? Well, um, if I now come to the complex setting, what is the absolute value of a complex number? It's going to be distance to the origin, all right? So this is distance um, from 3 plus 4i to the origin, okay? So the origin here, in terms of the picture, plays the same role as zero, because the origin represents zero plus zero i, right, which is zero, okay? So it's still distance from this guy to zero, right, because the origin is zero. So let me write, um, let me write it actually to zero, and then put origin in quotes here, all right? Okay, so in terms of complex numbers, the absolute value now perfectly makes sense. And one very, very important fact here to notice is that um, because the absolute value of a complex number is a distance, that means it's always a positive number or zero, right? Um, but it's not a complex number. It's not an imaginary number. It's a, it's a real number, okay? Because it's an actual distance. 
All right, so here's where the trig kind of comes in. Um, what exactly is the absolute value of 3 plus 4i, right? So let's take a look at the picture. 3 plus 4i lives right there. If I drop this perpendicular down here, I have a right triangle. Um, this position is at 3. This position is at 4. So my, my right triangle has side 3 here and um, height 4 there. Okay, so um, the hypotenuse is square root 3 squared plus 4 squared, which happens to be square root five, uh, um, 25, which happens to be 5. All right, so this guy here is actually going to be, let me write it like this, 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is equal to 5. Okay. All right, so because we know a little bit of triangular trig, uh, we can always calculate the absolute value of a um, complex number, okay? Just because it's it's always um, the length of a hypotenuse. All right, so you can do this with any complex number, um, 3 minus 2i, so that would be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, right? Minus 2 is here, 3 is there. This would represent my point. Um, that length right there represents um, the absolute value. And then, of course, this height is 2 because we're going down by two steps. This length here is 3. And so this hypotenuse is square root uh, 3 squared plus 2 squared. Okay. And so 3 minus 2i, the absolute value of it is equal to square root 3 squared plus 2 squared, whatever that is. So this is not completely nice, 9 plus 4, which is square root 13, all right? But again, uh, it's important to note, it's just a, re it's a real number because it represents the length of that segment of that hypotenuse. All right, um, in general, the absolute value of A plus IB, here's the picture, you're going A to here, B to there, you want the hypotenuse, right? And again, when you drop this triangle down here, um, this height is B, that height is A. So this guy is going to be square root A squared plus B squared. All right? So square root A squared plus B squared. Okay, so the absolute value of a complex number um, makes sense. And again, you should think of it as a distance, right? Distance to zero or distance to the origin in terms of the picture. All right, uh, something very interesting to notice here. A squared plus B squared, we've seen that before, right? When we did um, A plus IB, sorry, um, why did I write A plus IB? BI, right? That's our kind of convention, at least for now. A plus BI times A minus BI, right? Uh, remember, if we call this Z, this would be Z bar. If I take, um, if I multiply these together, uh, we said that this was a squared plus b squared. Again, nothing fancy here. We're just foiling it out, multiplying it out, and we get a squared plus b squared. So this a squared plus b squared, right, is the same as that one there. And so we, we notice that the absolute value of a complex number z is actually equal to square root of z times z bar. All right? And oftentimes you'll see this stated as z times z bar is equal to the absolute value squared. All right, so it's a nice observation, um, which tells you, uh, which kind of gives you an understanding of how the complex num uh, conjugate relates to a complex number itself, right? When you multiply these two together, you get the length. All right, um, so that's a tiny bit of trig, uh, but let's do more trig. So um, up to now, right, we've been writing a plus bi, and we've been visualizing it with by going a to the, you know, along the x-axis and b along the y-axis, and that's going to be a plus bi, right? Um, but just now, right, we, we figured out this length right there, right? That guy right there is square root a squared plus b squared, right? And what we're going to do is, um, in general, we're going to call this length, we're going to call it r. All right, and we'll see this is going to be very useful for us for um, actually all the way to the rest of this uh, end of the semester almost. All right, so we're going to call this this hypotenuse R here, right? And then we're going to look at this angle right there. I'm going to call that theta. All right, 
Now the important feature here is um, the coordinate right there, uh, that point right there, can be described using two numbers, a and b, right? a plus bi. But it can also be described using the numbers r and theta, right? So in other words, if I tell you I'm thinking of the complex number whose distance to zero or distance to the origin is 10 and whose angle with the x-axis is 12 degrees, then which complex number am I talking about? There's only one then, right? 12 degrees, so this has to be 12 degrees. And then it has to be a distance of 10 away, right? So this guy here is 10, all right? So I can describe complex numbers um, in two ways. One as something plus something i, and the other using a distance and an angle, all right? So let me kind of represent that information here. I can represent a complex number using r and theta, or I can represent a complex number using a and b, okay? All right, so um, what happens is the A and B is very, very useful, uh, very nice, um, as you saw in se section 6.1, if you're doing, for example, addition of complex numbers, right? Super straightforward to add complex numbers when you have them in, in the form A plus BI, right? Um, multiplication and division were a little more complicated, right? So what's gonna happen is, um, when we describe complex numbers in terms of r and theta, um, addition, uh, uh, sorry, multiplication and division will be very simple, and addition and subtraction will be actually very complicated. All right. So when we want to work with multiplication or division of complex numbers, very frequently it's more profitable to think of them in terms of the r and the theta, as opposed to, or not to think of them, but to describe them using r and theta as opposed to describing them using A and B, all right? Okay, and this is super, super useful in real life because, um, because of the simplicity of multiplication, and we'll very, very soon see um, the multiplication actually has very nice uh, interpretations, especially when you talk about rotating motion or um, oscillatory motion. All right, so again, uh, I guess I should uh, write write it down at least once officially. This is distance to origin. This is angle with x-axis, with positive x-axis, right? This A, of course, is x-coordinate. The B is the y-coordinate. So that's how you would describe all of these um, kind of in words. All right, so of course, now that we have two ways to describe a complex number, the question is, um, how do I move from one description to the other, right? If I give you a complex number, 3 plus 4i, what is the r and what is the theta, right? If I want to describe it that way. Or if I give you r is equal to 5, theta is equal to 20, what is the a and the b, okay? Okay, so let's do um, exactly that. So the good news is one, one of these directions of kind of uh, conversion is easy, but the bad news is one of them is not so easy. So the easy one is converting from R and theta to A and B. So for example, if I have the complex number where R is equal to um, 10, let's just do the example above, R is equal to 10, theta is equal to 12 degrees, right? And for some reason, our book really likes to use degrees in this section. So I'll do some examples using degrees. Um, then the question is, what is, this is what plus what I, right? What are A and B, right? Question mark, question mark. Um, and it's fairly, fairly straightforward because again, if we think of the picture, this means we're going a distance of 10 away from the origin. So this is 10. We're doing an angle of 12 degrees, right? Um, what is the A? It's the X coordinate. What is the B? It's the Y coordinate, right? So what I'm looking for is, this length there, right, goes there. And then this height there goes there, all right? And this is where, again, trig comes in. So the, the uh, horizontal length is um, the adjacent side of this right triangle. So we know cosine of 12 degrees is adjacent, uh, the guy we want, right, the A, over hypotenuse, which is 10, 
all right? And so that tells me that A is equal to 10 cos 12 degrees, all right? Um, for the uh, vertical side, we know that sine of 12 degrees, right, is opposite over hypotenuse. So that's going to be B over 10, right? So this is my A, that's my B. And so that means B is equal to 10 sine of 12 degrees. And so we know if, if we have a complex number described as R is equal to 10 and theta is equal to 12 degrees, that corresponds to, um, in standard form, 10 cos 12 degrees plus um, 10 sine 12 degrees times I. All right. So moving in, in this direction is, is fairly straightforward. All right. Um, what about the other way? Oh, sorry, actually, before I talk about the other way, um, of course, this also works if I say R is equal to 10 and theta is equal to uh, 250 degrees, right? Um, uh, just from the R, remember, if you think all the way back to our original definition of sines and cosines as X coordinates and Y coordinates, um, on a unit circle. So you don't necessarily have to kind of draw a triangle. You still get the same result that um, this corresponds to 10 cosine 250 degrees plus 10 sine 250 degrees times I. All right. Okay. Um, so, so this is uh, fairly straightforward. The other direction is the one that's um, a little difficult, and uh, let's do that. Actually, uh, what I want to do um, before we do that is I want to introduce a bit of notation, so um, trigonometric form. So we already talked about standard form, right? That's to write our... Uh, uh, complex number as a number, a real number plus another real number times i. Trigonometric form is this, is essentially the r and the theta. All right? So um, what happens is up here, we found that um, when r was 10 and theta were t was 12, we had 10 cos 12 degrees plus 10 sine 12 degrees times i. All right? So trigonometric form actually is, we take that same expression, 10 cos 12 degrees, plus 10 sine 12 degrees, I, like this, and we pull out the 10. So 10 times cos 12 degrees plus sine 12 degrees times I. All right, now uh, let me write like this. Now traditionally, uh, um, uh, the I actually in, in this form, so this is, trig, uh, this is almost trigonometric form. This is kind of the, the way we want to write it. But in trigonometric form, we traditionally write the, um, uh, the i in front of the uh, the sine. So this is equal to this, is equal to 10. This is, this is totally just notation, writing the i in front. So i sine 12 degrees. So this is the trigonometric form of um, uh, this complex number right there, all right? Or this complex number right there in, in the picture, okay? All right, so the, um, Essentially, the relevant information is the 10. That's the distance. And then these two numbers are always the same. They have to be the same. They must be the same. All right? 12 degrees. And in trigonometric form, we always want this number to be a plus. All right? So this should be a plus. Okay. And these, uh, let me write, these have to be the same because they represent the angle. And this is, this is the, uh, again, the distance to, uh, to origin. All right? Okay, so this uh, this guy up here, um, 10 cos 250 degrees plus 10 sine 250 degrees I, we would write that as 10 cosine 250 degrees plus um, uh, I sine 250 degrees, all right? Okay, so the important feature is that we should be able to see the, um, see the degrees or see the angle, see the angle, all right? I actually want to write it as, um, I want to have the cosine and the sine um, uh, there, all right? Okay, because that allows me to read off the, um, the r and the theta. Okay, um, 
So let's um, let's transform the other way. So uh, let me let me rephrase it like this. Now that we have this terminology of trigonometric form, so let me say write six root three plus six i in trig. Uh, trigonometric form. Okay, so this is essentially moving from standard form, this guy right there, um, to uh, the r and the theta, right? Because when you write it in trig form, you easily see the r and the theta. All right. Okay, um, how do we do this? Well, uh, I think a good way to do these problems is to write down what we have, 6 root 3, plus 6i, and then write down what we need. So this, in trig form, means we need the, the, the distance to the origin, which we're uh, calling in general r, right? So this is r times cosine of the angle, right? Up here was 12 degrees, but we don't know it yet, so let's call it theta, plus i sine 12 degrees. We don't know it yet, so again, the same theta, and then close parentheses, all right? So what we're looking for is we're looking for the r, and we're looking for the theta. Okay, so once we found those, we, we put those numbers in there, and then that's trig form, all right? Okay, so how do we do this? Um, it looks very complicated. It looks like a very complicated equation, uh, but if we think about it geometrically, we know that this r is the distance to the origin, right? Um, sorry. Or let me, let me say it like this. This is, uh, uh, well, let me write distance to origin. And of course, that's the same as absolute value. Right? So what I can do is I can just calculate the absolute value of the guy that I'm given, and immediately I got R. All right? So R is, oops. R is equal to absolute value 6 root 3 plus 6i. Right? And what is the absolute value? It's 6 root 3 squared plus 6 squared whole thing square root, right? So just calculating that, that's going to give me uh, 6 squared times 3 plus 6 squared square root. That's going to be square root 6 squared times 4, which is 6 times 2, which is 12, all right? So instantaneously, I know r. r is equal to 12, okay? So let me update the uh, information that I, that I know. So 6 root 3 plus 6i is equal to 12 cosine theta plus i sine theta. Okay, so now my only goal um, is to figure out theta, right? Because I figured out r. How do I do that? Well, um, the easy way to do this is I divide by 12 on both sides, right? So I would get... When I divide by 12, 6 over 12 is 1 half. So root 3 over 2 plus 1 half i is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. All right. Okay. Now, um, I'm pretty much all set because this cos theta had better match with the root 3 over 2. And this sine theta had better match with the 1 half. Right, because the i term has to go with the i term, and the non-i term has to go with the non-i term. Right, so that means I have an equa a, a system of equations or two equations: cosine theta equals root three over two. Uh, and let me emphasize: and I need both sine of theta equals one half. All right, so I need to find theta. So our goal now is to find theta that solves both this guy and that guy, all right? Okay, so the way we can do this is we can solve either one first, right? Um, cosine of theta equals root three over two, right? Cos theta equals root three over two. And here, um, because we're talking about uh, the angle theta, kind of visualizing it, um, we want theta to be between zero and two pi, right? 
or between 0 and negative 2 pi. We'll worry about that a little bit later. But mm -hmm. between 0 and 2 pi. So we don't have to do the, the very complicated solutions, right? Cosine theta equals uh, root 3 over 2. There's only two solutions between 0 and 2 pi, right? Um, one of the solutions is theta is equal to, um, I guess we've been using degrees. So 60 degrees, sorry, uh, 30 degrees, right? So that would be right there. But we can notice that there's another solution right there. That would be 2 pi here is 360 degrees. So this guy would be 360 minus 30 degrees. So 330 degrees. Okay, so theta equals 330 degrees. Those are my two possibilities. So now I have to check which one of these two possibilities is compatible with sine theta equals a half, right? And the deal is only one of them is going to work. So sine of 30 degrees is one half, but when, if you think about it, sine 330 degrees, uh, if I look at the picture for sine, it's going to be a negative number equals minus a half, right? So sine 30 degrees is a half, so that's what I'm looking for. So I know that this theta equals 330 degrees is not what I want, and so theta is equal to 30 degrees. All right, so theta is equal to 30 degrees. So ultimately, that means my final answer is um, 6 root 3 plus 6i is equal to, and here's the trig form. Uh, we said it was uh, um, absolute value 12, right? And then cosine of 30 degrees plus i sine of 30 degrees. Okay, so this would be the trig form on the right-hand side. And again, the important feature is you can see the r and you can see the theta in front of your eyes, all right? So again, we think of this as transforming from standard form on the left to trig form on the right. Okay, um, a more kind of uh, interesting example or complicated example would be, let's say, um, uh, five, plus 5 root 3, oh, let's, let's do minus, sorry, minus i, right? So write in trig form, right? So here we've got the absolute value of it, minus 5 root 3 i is equal to 5 squared plus 5 squared times 3 square root. That's equal to square root 5 squared times 4, which is 5 times 2, which is 10, all right? So we were supposed to be uh, writing it in trig form. So that means we wanted this to be r, which we know is 10 now, and then cos theta plus i sine theta, right? We divide by 10 on both sides, so we get 1 half minus root 3 over 2i is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta, right? And then again, this reduces to a problem that we already know how to work with. We want to solve cos theta equals 1 half and sine theta equals minus root 3 over 2. Okay. Cos theta equals a half. Again, we're only looking for solutions between 0 and 2 pi. So cosine theta equals a half tells me theta is equal to uh, 60 degrees. Well, let me do radians this time. Um, pi over 3, right? Just, uh, again, just to, so we're, we're comfortable switching between radians and uh, degrees. So pi over 3, but again, there's a there's a second solution, right? Here's pi over 3. Here's the other one, which is 2 pi minus pi over 3. Right? So that's going to be, um, if I just do common denominators, 5 pi over 3. All right? So I have two possibilities, right there and right there. And I now compare it with sine. So sine of the first guy, pi over 3, is actually positive root 3 over 2. Right? So that means we do not want pi over 3. Right? On the other hand, sine of 5 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And so that means that um, this number, 5 minus 5 root 3i, is 10 times cosine of, um, sorry, uh, 5 pi over 3 plus i sine 5 pi over 3. Okay. So you always do have to consider um, your multiple possibilities, right? Uh, pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. 
because only one of them is going to work and it might not be obvious which one, all right? Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so what about um, numbers like this? Uh, Z equals five, right? Right, oops, right in trig form. Right, so this one looks a little weird because there's no I, but remember this is five plus zero I. All right, and if you want to do this in the same way that we did it, you know, these two examples above, you can do it in exactly the same way, right? Um, absolute value of five is five, so that means R is equal to five. Right, and then you would solve five plus zero i equals five times cos theta plus i sine theta, divide by five on both sides. So you want one plus zero i equals cos theta plus i sine theta. That means you need to solve cos theta equals one and sine theta equals zero. Right, now looking at cos theta, um, cos theta equals one is at, there's only one solution, um, at a zero. And so that means theta is equal to zero. And of course, at zero, sine, sine zero is zero. All right? And so ultimately, that means five is equal to five times cos zero plus I sine zero. All right? So this would be five in standard, in um, trig form. Okay? All right. On the other hand, um, this particular example you can get immediately because um, just thinking of the picture, right? Where is five in the complex plane? Five is um, on the x-axis. One, two, three, four, five. On the x-axis. Right there is five. Right? And so what is the angle? Um, well, first of all, what is the distance from here to here? It's, of course, five. What is the angle that this ray here makes with the x-axis? The angle is zero. Right? So obviously, um, theta should be zero. So that's an alternate way to reason out this zero and that zero right there. Okay? So in the same way, a really good exercise is for you to think about, what about 6i, right? What is this in trig form? Uh, equals what in trig form, right? And again, you can solve it in the same way we solve the ones above, but this one you should be able to reason out. And you should probably think about it for a couple seconds, maybe pause the video. Um, think about it, and then um, I'll tell you, all right? Okay, so here's how you um, reason it out. And again, you can solve for it just like above, like um, like doing it like this. But in, in this case, you can reason it out because 6i six, six lives right there, right? Because 6i is 0 plus 6i, so the position is 0 comma 6, right? Now, this guy, right, this position right here, what is its distance? To the origin, it's exactly six, right? So that means um, six i should be six times, and then the cosine and the sines, right? Cosine of something, um, i sine of something. Okay, what should the angle be? Well, we can literally see the angle, right? There, there's our point. The angle is this angle right there, right? Sorry, this angle right there. But what is that angle? That's ninety degrees, right? We can literally see it. So that would be cosine of pi over two. I sine of pi over two, all right? Okay, so you can figure out minus seven I, you can figure out minus 10, right? What are those guys in um, trig form, all right? So that's a good exercise, to, just to reason those out. Okay, so now that we know how to um, kind of represent uh, trig, uh, sorry, complex numbers in different ways, Let's actually see why we care about this trig form, right? So it seems kind of ugly, right, and complicated. You know, you have this cosine, you have this sine. Um, but here's where um, we can see the power of trig form. So let's uh, talk about, so I said trig form is good for multiplication. So let's actually literally see that now. So multiplication. So let me write down two um, complex numbers that are already in trig form, all right? So say we've already converted them to trig form if they weren't in trig form. So the first complex number, I'm going to call it Z1, 
and its um, in trig form, again, I'm doing this in general, so it's going to be R1 cosine theta 1 plus I sine theta 1, all right? And my second one is going to be Z2, R2, sorry, big parentheses here, of course. The R has to multiply to both. R2 cosine theta 2 plus I sine theta 2, all right? Okay, so what's Z1 times Z2, all right? So let's actually calculate this and see, see something will be really cool. So Z1 times Z2, let's just multiply them, right? Um, so this is going to be R1 cos theta 1 plus I sine theta 2, and then times R2 cos theta 2 plus I sine theta 2, all right? Okay, so the R1 and the R2, I can put them together, so that's R1 times R2. And then the rest of these, I'm gonna, I'm gonna multiply them out. Cosine theta one, cosine theta two. I have cosine theta one times I sine theta two. That's an I right there. Uh, so let me write that as I cos theta one, uh, sorry, times sine theta two. I have I sine theta two times cosine theta two. So plus I sine theta two times cosine theta, sorry, I sine, ah, oh, sorry about this, that's a one, because this is this is all the ones and that's all the twos. Uh, looks okay so far, okay. I sine theta one, cosine theta two, and then plus I times I is negative one, right? So it's actually a minus sine theta one, sine theta two, all right? And all of this times R1, uh, R2. Uh, I guess I should, let me put the parentheses kind of like this. Okay, this looks horrible, but what we're going to do is we're going to combine the terms that have i's and the ones that don't have i's. So this one has no i, that one has no i, all right? And then this one has an i, and that one has an i. Or I should box the whole thing, i, i. Okay, so uh, let's, let's write the red ones together like this. So this is r1, r2, and let me put parentheses here cosine theta one, cosine theta two, minus sine theta one, sine theta two, and then plus I times cosine theta one, sine theta two, plus sine theta one, cosine theta two. Uh, let, me, let me write this again. Plus sine theta one, cosine theta two. Sorry, that's a plus right there. Okay. Um, it still maybe looks horrible, but it shouldn't because these, th these four guys, these two guys here, you should recognize them. And these guys here, you should recognize them. All right, so maybe take a minute to stare at them and see if you recognize them. Um, and hopefully what you'll see is this is equal to cosine of theta one plus theta two, right? And th this is one of the major reasons why we actually talked about uh, how to um, break the cosine theta one plus theta two or cosine of alpha plus beta into smaller pieces, right? And of course, this one here is sine of theta one plus theta two. All right, so ultimately, this is equal to R1, R2 times cosine theta one plus theta two plus I sine theta one plus theta two. All right, so what we've done is we've written Z times Z bar, the product of my two complex numbers, into trig form, and we can see the trig form is super simple. Um, the distance to the origin of the product is just you multiply the two distances, all right? Um, the angles, the new angle of the product is just the sum of the angles of the individual two guys, all right? So in pictures, if Z1 had an angle of theta 1, right, so here's Z1 has a uh, distance of R1, angle theta 1. And if Z2 maybe looks something like this, theta 2 
let's make its distance maybe a little short here, R2, right? This guy is Z2. Then what's Z1 times Z2? Z1 times Z2 is you go an angle of theta, 1, and then you go another angle of theta 2, and then you multiply the, the two um, lengths, R1 times R2, R1 times R2. So this is going to be Z1 times Z2. All right, and the most important feature is actually this uh, addition of angles. All right, so when you multiply two complex numbers together, what happens is their angles in the product, the angles actually just add. All right, that's super, super important, um, especially when you're talking about rotating motion, right? Because oftentimes if you're working with something that's rotating, right, you're thinking about moving an angle of theta and then moving another angle of a different, you know, theta two, right? And what that means is you can represent, you know, these two motions, like moving theta one and then moving theta two by the product of two complex numbers, all right? So super, super useful, super, super, super important, actually. All right, so <clears throat> how, how could we, um, uh, how do we use this like just in a, in a computation? Um, well, if you have something like um, 2 cosine 13 degrees plus I sine 13 degrees times 5 um, cosine 17 degrees plus I sine 17 degrees, right? This is the product of two complex numbers. Um, you can instantaneously write out the answer. So this is 2 times 5, 10. And then, um, because again, um, because both of these are complex numbers in trig form, I know that the angles will add. So this is 10, cosine of 13 plus 17 is 30, and then I sine of 30 degrees, all right? So I didn't have to do any real work to figure out um, this product, because I knew that the angles just add up. And again, this 100% depends on the fact that um, both these guys are in trig form. All right, you're not allowed to do this if they're not in trig form, okay? Uh, in particular, I want to emphasize um, both of these have to be plus, all right? All right, um, and of course, uh, in this particular example, the cosine 30 and sine 30, you can write them out. So this is 10 uh, root 3 over 2 plus i times um, 1 half, all right? So ultimately, we get 5 root 3 plus 5i um, in, in, in um, standard form, okay? In trig form, again, this would be your answer, okay? And which, which one you want to use in practice in real life depends on the context of, you know, your application. If you are talking about rotations, then you probably want to leave it like this because perhaps you might do a further rotation, right? In which case you multiply another complex number to this. Um, or in other circumstances, you might want to convert it to um, standard form. Okay, um, so you'll see um, uh, some problems in the in the online homework where they give you two complex numbers. Let's say z equals two plus two i z one, z two equals let's say seven plus um, uh, seven root three i, right? And they want you to multiply them. Um, in, in trig form. So what they mean by that is they want you to convert them both to trig form. Um, so uh, let me write like this. Multiply in trig form. Uh, yeah, uh, let me write like this, sorry. Multiply using trig form. All right, so what they mean by this is they want you to convert Z1 and Z2 into trig form. So Z1, they want you to convert it to R1 cos theta 1 plus i sine theta 1, using the, the conversion that we talked about earlier. You, they want you to do the same thing with z2, r2, theta 2, theta 2, right? And then they want you to multiply these two guys together, right? So the product of these is going to be product is r1, r2, cosine theta 1 plus theta 2, plus i sine theta 1 plus theta 2, right? And then I think they want you to, yeah, they want you to convert it back. Now, convert back to um, standard form. 
okay? Which means multiply the R1 and the R2 um, back in, and then compute the cosine and the sine, all right? Um, obviously, if they gave, if in, in practice, if you got two things in standard form like this, you could just multiply them, right? Two plus two I times seven plus seven root three I, right? Um, you know, by multiplying it out. But here, the, the, the point of the exercise is to, is for you to practice conversion to trig form and then to understand that products uh, behave very easily or very nicely in trig form, okay? So while you might be able to cheat the problem by doing this, probably if just for your ben for your own benefit, you know, do it the way they, they kind of ask you to do it. <laughs> okay, so that's multiplication. What about quotients? Right? Mul we know that multiplication and division are very related, right? Um, uh, well, essentially because division is multiplication, right? 3 over 5 is actually 3 times 1 fifth, right? So if multiplication behaves nicely uh, with respect to trig form, then do quotients behave nicely? And the answer is yes. If I have Z1 in trig form, and I have Z2 in trig form, then their quotient is actually, you just take the quotients of their um, lengths, R1 over R2, and then what happens to the angle? The angles just um, subtract. Cosine of theta one minus theta two plus I sine theta one minus theta two. All right. So um, when you multiply, the angles add. When you subtract the angles, uh, sorry, when you divide, the angles subtract. Right. So again, right. Uh, we we had already noticed that um, in standard form, right. When you take the quotient three plus four i over four plus five i, it doesn't look that nice, right? Um, and the answer you get after you simplify it, it really doesn't. It's not very illuminating, right? But here, when you multiply, you can literally see that um, you're kind of adding angles or subtracting angles. So again, in terms of rotating motion, it's very profitable to think of, um, to work with tr uh, uh, complex numbers um, in that context. Okay, so um, why is this one true? So why? So you do this. All right, so how do you do this? You do this in exactly the same way we did the product. Um, you, you write z1 over z2 equals r1 cos theta 1 plus uh, cos theta 2. Sorry, <laughs> um, i sine theta 1 divided by r2 over cos theta 2 plus i sine theta 2. Um, immediately, you can see the r1 over r2. So that basically resolves itself. And then you need to think about how to simplify this guy here. All right. Um, and it should be doable for you because you already know how to deal with something like 3 plus 4i over 4 plus 5i, right? You know how to deal with i's in the denominator, which is, which is the issue here, right? There's an i in the denominator. So you deal with that, and then um, it'll be a little messy, but ultimately you'll pop these guys out. You really, really, really should do this as practice <laughs> because it also reviews... Um, uh, those formulas, right? Recognizing uh, the formulas for cosine and sine of sums or uh, of differences. Okay, um, so that'll be it for 6.2. Um, perhaps it might look to you like, you know, we haven't done too much, you know, transforming to trig form. You know, we do see this nice idea of multiplication um, of complex numbers being related to rotate or uh, rotation of angles, right? Um, but maybe it doesn't look like it's that applicable, right, necessarily. But 6.3, we're going to use the trig form very, very heavily in order to solve problems that uh, previously you could not do at all, all right?